Welcome to the Karen Kenny Show. This is the place where we take a no bullshit look at life's little lessons. Here, together, we find the spiritual glory in even the most wicked hard story. This is a journey from fear back to love and how we can find our greatest strength and happiness in some of the most unlikely places. I believe that if you're willing to change your mind, you can totally change your life. So, are you ready to rewrite your story and choose to live free? Let's do this. Hey, you guys. Welcome to the Karen Kenny Show. You know I try to do it a little different like every time. You guys, look it. You already listened to the intro, but I've got some stories for you today. You have no idea how wicked excited I am to have Josh Pice on the Karen Kenny Show. Josh, thank you so much for being here. I'm sure on some level you're like, I don't even know exactly how I'm here or why I'm here yet, but I'm going to tell you. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I'm here. Let's, let's find out why I'm here. Okay. So the short story is, so I um, am a big fan. So number one, I'm a huge fan. Uh, that's the first thing. Number two, so let me do this. Let me ground you in like my world just for a second. So you know who you're talking to a little bit. I'll make it brief. So I'm a spiritual mentor. I'm an author and writer. I'm a speaker. I'm a podcast host. I'm married to a professional musician who's a genius. She's like, multi-instrumentalist, singer, songwriter, producer. I, uh, I'm from the East Coast. I'm from Boston. <clears throat> Been a yoga teacher for like 20 years. I'm a gateless writing teacher. So not only was it like, I love Josh, actor, we'll dive into that, but I'm, I'm fascinated, fascinated by committed impulse and this, this approach or program or whatever you would call it to not just acting, but to creativity. And I'm obsessed with creative process. <clears throat> so I'm just like the kind of person that's like, hey, what's the worst that can happen? He'll just say no if he can't come on the show, but I'm determined and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. And so here you are, because I have so many questions. Great. Wicked excited because um, this show is normally like a solo show. I don't normally have guests on. I do like one a month. So I normally only have people on who I love, who I'm wicked curious about, and who are doing work in the world that like excites me or lights me up, or I think is amazing in helping people. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I think you check all those boxes. Wow. So here we are. I first became aware of you. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't know what's. <clears throat> I first became aware of you in 2013 because I was obsessed with the show Psych. And I know you were on an episode with like Anthony Michael Hall and the guys from Psych. Do you, I'm, you're nodding your head. Yes, you remember yeah. that. Yeah, I remember that. Sure. So I see you on the screen and I'm like, and it's just like, it's, I don't think it was that huge of a pot, but I remembered your face. And then later that year, whatever, I joined B-School or and I'm Marie Forleo, who is your sweetie, who is your, your beloved, your wife. And when I make the connection, I say out loud, oh, she's married to that guy. And so then I get curious about you and I start to learn about you. Now, also as a Boston kid, I'm obsessed with the show Ray Donovan. And I see you on Ray Donovan. And now I just have to say, I'm gonna ask you, I wanna know all about your origin story. I, I did my homework, like I did a little research on you and I watched this one particular interview and the whole time you were talking, I was just like checking these boxes, like ding, ding, ding. Like you and I, I'm not, there are so many things that you talk about that just my hat and my mind were just like firing. And I was like right there with you. And I was just so jazzed. So on Ray Donovan, you play yeah. this character, Stu Feldman, and I'm obsessed with your character. But what I, what I start to realize slowly as like this isn't stocky and like weird but i become a little obsessed with every character you play and what i realize now after researching committed impulse it's because who and how you are when you show up on the screen 
And it's all about presence. And I'm going to shut up for a sec. So if there's anything you want to say before I keep going. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is, you know, that's been my, my journey is just, um, you know, starting out as an actor that wanted to plan every moment because it felt safe to plan this and then, and then do it and then hope that it goes well. And that's kind of how I started out. And it just was not fulfilling. It was not, it didn't create interesting work. And I really went on a, a deep dive journey, a personal journey into how can I be more spontaneous? How can I be not operate out of my head, but work from the, the charges and the impulses and the energy and, you know, the truth of what I'm actually is, is happening. Um, and, and so, you know, that was, you know, and it still is an ongoing passion to, um, to create from, from my, the charges in my body. And then I've created a whole set of tools to alter, uh, when needed to alter the chemistry in my body in a sense and the energetic patterns in my body and then tell the truth about that. And in, you know, in this day and age, audiences want are so hungry for something that's real, you know, that that's just actually happening in that moment. And, you know, the beauty of that is that every presenter, performer, anybody that works with other people has that, you know, that information exists there in that moment of like, the, what is that truth, you know? And so, <clears throat> You know, of course, what gets in the way of it is, well, many things. One is um, that most of us, maybe all of us, have a range of body sensations that we're okay with, a range of emotions that we're okay with. And, but as soon as we, these other emotions that are quote unquote bad emotions yeah. occur, if we haven't trained ourselves to withstand it all, then we go on some kind of autopilot and we shut ourselves down and we present something that, you know, and so it's just been an undoing and trying to expand as, so that I have this big a range to create within and, and, you know, and that's when I'm not acting, you know, that's what I, I teach people. I, I I have to like, I've, I've been tr muzzling myself the whole time you're talking because I just want to double amen hands everything that you're saying because it's so powerful. It's so powerful, but it's like, you speak my language. Like, even though like I'm a spiritual mentor, like I'm, a, I'm over here and being on stage, which we can talk about that in a second. I've been on stage as an actor once in my senior high school play, right. uh, but it was not it was not for me because the only role i really know how to play is myself so i'm fascinated how that like ties in but everything you're saying is so incredible and it reminds me of my sweetie and i were just talking about this earlier because he's aware of you too because we're both fans and i was saying you know josh reminds me of and i'm not going to make the assumption you know him but you probably will josh reminds me of chris cooper mm. you know who chris cooper is yeah sure so, so Chris is an inc amazing actor yeah. and he is good friends with my beloved friend and writing mentor, um, Andre Debus III, who mm -hmm. wrote the book House of Sand and Fog. So I've had the pleasure to meet Chris Cooper and his wife uh, yeah. several times. And she's also an actor. She was on The Sopranos. She's incredible. Um, but when you, when Chris is on screen, like, I can't take my eyes off of him. Yeah, he's amazing. He's like riveting. But Josh, here's my point. You're in the Joker and you're like the clown shop owner guy, right? And it's like Joaquin's doing his thing. And of course he's like brilliant and he's on fire. But I can't, I can't take my eyes off of you in that scene too because you are a fully embodied like actor, like I am not like, and this is what I don't understand about acting. So please enlighten me. <laughs> Cause I love all your characters. So I'm thinking to myself, but there's gotta be 
Like you're in there somewhere, right? Like Josh is bringing Completely. something. So it's, it's not- all, It's all me. But I mean, any actor that says, oh, that character is nothing like me. It's like, how could you do it then? But it's like you're bringing, so I think about like when people play roles like Joaquin did or when like Jim Carrey did as Kaufman, right? And I'm like, when they just stay in that role and they're just like, they, I'm like, does Jim Carrey just like go in a back room? Like is, is Jim just like back here somewhere? Or like how much of yourself, meaning like, do you tap into parts of you that know that already exists because you're multidimensional and you're like a kaleidoscope? Like, how does it happen? Yeah, it's very much about, I you when I started out, I would try to create like a mask in a sense mm -hmm. to hide behind because that felt safer to me. Again, not interesting, didn't generate <laughs> much work for me. Um, but then, it is, it's, it's all about, in a sense, I work very physically. Yes. And, and but, but, phys, like, or, uh, the word this came in is, like, holistically. Um, I have judgment about saying that about myself. I'm back. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> we got to talk uh, about I'm back, too, okay, but okay. Go, go ahead. But it's, it's about um, accessing, like, altering elements in my physicality that then and being open to those alterations so that it stimulates my imagination and gets me spontaneous like the whole thing is to get to a place where it's effortless i'm not thinking about how i'm going to say anything i've just kind of turned myself on creatively in a certain direction and then kind of let it unfold in the unknown. And that's another thing that's key, I think, for any art, any, any certainly perform, any, uh, you know, performance art or, you know, art where you're, you know, acting, dancing, you know, singing, um, even public speaking, anything where you're presenting, yeah. like there has to be an unknown element to engage the audience. If it's all known and it's like, all set it's like people can't engage with it and people are so hungry especially in this era for seeing something that's actually unfolding it's so beautiful because i have this little meme picture uh that i send to my clients and it's like a, just a stick drawing of this could be a girl or a boy but just like a head in this red triangle dress and the arms are up like this and they're shouting I have no idea what's going to happen. And I send it to my clients when they start to like, try to like, like we always say like, Jesus, take the wheel, right? Like they try to grab the wheel back from the natural inheritance of just being present and in the moment with your breath and with your body and like knowing that you have the tools within you to navigate whatever the fuck life throws at you. Absolutely. So it's that magic that you are describing. And so like, I really, really like, I just love it so much. And it makes me think about like, you just came back from the Ukraine from filming a feature role, right? Yeah. And I'm pretty sure you're playing a spy in the film. Yes. So you, you, I mean this in a loving way, you're a little bit of a tease, right? You're a little bit of a tease on your blog post where you shared this amazing little story about the person that you met to prepare for your role, yeah. who was like a real life spy. Yes. And you, I'm not gonna, I want you to tell the story, but you tell the story about this assignment that you were giving, like meeting the stranger in the strange place, do the thing with the sunglasses, whatever. And you only shared one and like, I commented on there like, brother, you've got to tell us the other assignment. So can you just share a little bit about that? Um, sure. Well, um, so in the movie, um, uh, I can't say everything about it, but, um, but I play uh, an American that was uh, enlisted by Mossad, which is the Israeli spy organization. And there are 
a lot of Americans that are working um, under Mossad, actually. And, um, and some of the people uh, are, that are behind the film are very connected to Mossad and have a lot of insight into, into the life of a spy. And this, this movie, you know, the writers, and it's very true, it's like the first movie about what it's really like to be a spy. And, and a lot of what being a spy is, is being sent on a mission, go to a hotel, stay there for three months, and just keep an eye out if somebody unusual shows up. <laughs> and it becomes very mundane. It becomes, it's not James Bond. And a lot of these guys start to lose it because they have to live a life of lying and they have to assume this personality and every day is the same and they you know in in the movie my character is going through this and he starts to go rogue he just like he becomes that. delusional and <laughs> thinks he's seeing you know found something and anyway um so the people uh the director set me up with a meeting with he said, I want you to meet this guy. Uh, and he's in, he's a spy, he's in Mossad. And, um, and you know, I think, and I said, that's great. I would, I would love that because I was trying to wrap my head around it. Um, and basically, you know, he said, meet in this mall in at Long Island City. I was like, okay, I got, you know, I got a note and said, you know, when you get there, sit at this table. There was an image, a photo of the table. It was all through encrypted messages. Sit down, wear sunglasses, lift them on your forehead, and then he will approach you. Like, that's the signal. And so anyway, so I, I meet with this guy and uh, he said, you know, I'd love to know he said, I know you have a lot of questions. I can't answer everything. And, but, you know, ask away. And so I asked him, you know, what, what was some of the early training like? And he said, well, we're going to do that today. And can uh, I ask you an honest question? Yes. Well, okay. Mr. Committed Impulse, right? Like when, when that, I'll call it a challenge or opportunity, right? Presents itself. Like, this is your realm, right? This is your playground. Like you're like the committed impulse, spontaneous, but you got your steps, your four steps, which we'll talk about. So do you get excited? Like, or do you get like, oh shit, what's about to happen? Like, like how does your body react to the, being I put mean, in that? It was almost like bubbles. I was like, <laughs> really, I'm going to do a mission in this mall? You know, it was just like, what? And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and you know, he basically said, uh, you know, in, in the mission that I wrote about on the blog, yeah. you know, he said, uh, he said you see, there's, a, there's a shoe store over there. It was like a big sneaker store. And he said, there's, win there's sneakers in the window. And he said, your mission, he said, go in, assess the place, see if it feels normal, see if there's anything unusual. And, um, and get one of the people that work there to swap out the sneakers in the store with the pair of sneakers that you choose. And I'm like, how am I gonna do this? And he said, that's your mission. And he also said, this was a mission that he was given, off, that he was given early on just as a test to see how he would deal you know, in this uh, alternate reality. He said, after doing this, he said it changed his perspective about going into any store after that. And so I, you know, long story short, I basically, I went in, I saw some Pumas, some old school Pumas, and I was like, you know, how am I going to do this? And then I, I uh, you know, I have a son, and yeah. so I said, he said that it's really key to use stories close to you so that you're not stretching too far out. So you're and not act so you don't start like, like, right. bolt, so you like, don't want to make up a story that's so that you that's so far out, you know. And so I I came, I came up with the idea that I'm going to tell uh, somebody in the shoe store that my, that 
and in this in the window were all these like bright colored super plasticky looking you know sneakers with you know <laughs> and um and so i took these old school leather pumas and i said you know i said my son is going to be meeting here me here in about 15 minutes and I always tell him that these are the coolest sneakers. And he always says the ones that you have in the window are the coolest sneakers. And I said, it would mean so much to me if you could put these in the window for when he comes. And then I could just, and, and then I, he'd think I was a cool dad. Oh my God. So I found like the meekest looking salesperson. And, and I told them that I said, I know this is strange, but, um, you know, can, would you do it for me? And, and, and he did it. Dude, I was like hooked. I was obsessed reading that story. And I was like, how's he going to pull this off? And as I'm reading it, I'm like, oh yeah, he's a dad. So like that feels natural to him. Like that'll be good. And I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, there's no way. Josh Pice is not going to be able to pull this off. Like I was already team Josh. Like I was rooting for you, but it was like cliffhanger. I was like, what's going to happen? Like, yeah. and I, I cannot wait. Cause I follow you on Instagram. So you guys, I'm going to tell you how to find Josh and all that stuff at the end, but I follow you. So I've been kind of watching like you getting your makeup done in the chair and right. you becoming the spy. And I'm obsessed. I was laughing so hard. I'm like, I was going to start sending you all these messages. I'm like, but he's going to be like, who is this crazy broad? But uh, <laughs> You, you remember prayers, like tracksuit prayers, <laughs> that post you did? Yes, yes. Yeah, well, I had a top, like, just like that. And I was just like, so I've been watching this thing of, like, you filming and, like, and I know a bunch of actors and, like, directors and people like that. When Because when I lived, I lived in L.A. for eight years. So when I lived out there, it was fascinating to, um, I worked at, um, Universal City Walk that the, at the time in the early 90s, uh, Cineplex Odeon up at Universal City Walk, City Walk was the biggest movie theater in the world. It had 18 mm. screens. Yes. And so I was a manager there. And so oh. this, I got to meet like, like it would just be so fascinating. Like every day somebody famous was coming in. And of course, you know them as like characters. And then you're like, well, who are they going to be in person? And are they going to be the same or feel the same or react the same, you know? And so it was like such an incredible time in my life to like just be meeting all these people. And then like afterwards, some of them, you're like, yeah, Jim Carrey is like all that kind of like that all the time. Right. And then it was like, oh, this one is so much quieter than I would think. Right. Like, and it was just like really, really fascinating. But so as I'm listening, like reading this story of you, like in this store and I'm like, there's no way, like I'm thinking of all the characters you've played and how diverse you are and how fucking smart you are. You're an intelligent creator, I think. Right. And I think it comes back to, like, I think you're the perfect, I'm trying to think of the word. You're, you were like the divine alchemy, I think, of both your parents. Cause your dad, super duper smarty pants, right? Mm -hmm. Holocaust survivor physicist, professor, scientist, works with Einstein for like 11 years. Yeah. No schlump. And then your mom, your mom is like a poet and a painter, a creative, right? Totally. Yeah. Bohemian, free spirit. So, okay. So you have the spirit and the science converging. Yeah. This concept of atomic particles and free radical whatever. And like, that is the birth child of like committed impulse. And I'm just thinking, and I'm sure you, obviously you've, <laughs> you're aware of this for, before I was, but I'm looking at it and I'm just thinking like, like, I think I read somewhere, I saw something where you were saying like, you would put on like salons or like gatherings in your living room as a kid. So tell me what you were like as a kid, like not the typical, like, oh, this is how I came into acting where, but like, what were you just like as a kid? Were you weird? Were you curious? Were you quiet? Um, I think I was, I, 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 yeah, I was all of those things. I, th I think, <laughs> I think I was quiet, but then there were certain, um, certain times where I was just completely fully out and expressive. And I think I was a little, I was definitely a little depressed as a kid, mm -hmm. um, and kind of like inward and like contemplative and like what's you know and i also you know i lit i grew up in a very dangerous neighborhood you know that was like um you know very raw 
you know, heroin and acid were the main drugs in there. It was I grew up in Alphabet City in, in New York, but it was also like so vibrant and so yes. like alive. Alive and so much connectivity and neighborhood. And, you know, I was pretty much protected in within that, you know, Avenue A, B, C, D in, in the East Village of New York. Mm -hmm. But anybody coming in from the outside was putting their life in their hands. But as just as a result of that, like there was so much to see, you know, there was so like these amazing characters, like oh. it was like the most like dude like there was like no boundaries like people had no they didn't give a shit like if they were angry they would just yell in the street and if they were sad they would just like cry on the stoop i knew you i knew it like there was no like it was just and then and my parents were divorced and then i would go visit my father on the upper east side you know in this very structured and very um proper in a sense and so um you know it was like that was like so much to deal with but it was also so awesome like it was just so like it was almost it was just like absorbing you like know your nervous system was stimulated oh yeah like almost that's probably why i was a little depressed yeah. to, keep, to keep myself from being able to handle everything like almost like booting down because the stimulus was you know, so immense, but I wouldn't change any of it, you know, like it was just so rich and so learned about life and so much, you know. I uh, think you're a total byproduct of your environment. And I, and it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing and to like touch on these points you brought up. I too, like I grew up in Lawrence, Massachusetts and it's like a hardcore, like, uh, you know, on the Merrimack Valley immigrant city, <clears throat> um, it was, intense and violent and you know and you're talking about this it's a it's kind of a perfect segue in a way so like you know my mother was murdered when i was 12 years old oh my god and so my nervous system was like totally overstimulated and traumatized right and like there was just this whole thing like the divorce and the fighting and like my stepfather and that side of the family were Italian and Portuguese so there was always like yelling and like somebody walked in a room and they greeted each other like Hey, asshole, like, it, like that was the loving thing. Right. And, but they were between Lawrence and Boston mass in, in my formative years growing up there, the cast of characters that I experienced and they were all just naturally fantastic storytellers. Yeah. So the rhythm, the yeah. pause, like the, the, the beat, of that language it just got in my dna and it's why i love storytelling of all kinds right yeah. but to my point how i want to kind of bring it to like committed impulse i think that being in my body like you were saying like you were depressed and trying to like you know bring it down being in my body felt like a crime scene like i was just like it's too much mm. and so like i i would like pull back right a lot of people just like leave their body so in a way, it kind of primed me for the witness consciousness of yoga, right? Like being able to just take a wide or broad view. But I think so many people who are drawn to the arts come from like traumatized or big or noisy or whatever childhood. I've never, I'm almost never met an actor on some level. Like I've dated so many musicians, obviously married one. I've dated actors. I started laughing when I remembered like, oh yeah, in 1990, when I graduated from BU, from Boston University, you were playing Raphael in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And my former boyfriend was uh, the original Red Ranger from the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And I was just like, like doing like all these connective wow. threads between you and I and laughing. So let's dive into, like I could go on and on. Like I said, I could go on and on about all the, all the shows and stuff you've been in. Also obsessed with Mrs. Fletcher. Cause I was lucky enough to take a writing workshop with Tom Parada who, who wrote wow. that book. And he's a sweetheart. He's amazing. And so smart. Love that guy. I, yeah, me too. Like, like amazing. But to my point, you're doing all this stuff and you talked about how, you know, you know, you, you, you get into acting. I think Roth, that, that the whole Ninja of Mutant Ninja Turtles, which here's another fun fact, Josh, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So my sweetie grew up in Dover, New Hampshire, 
And the two guys who wrote the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comic. Eastman and Laird, yeah. Yeah, so they he had like a first edition because when he was like a kid, he like got one. Wow. And so it was like all these like, oh my God, I can't wait to tell Josh, it's just so fun. But so like, let's dive into, you're an actor, you're doing your thing. Right. In the beginning, not going so great because you're trying to be an actor. <laughs> like you're putting on the costume and the mask and creating this separation. And I think one of the things that you do so beautifully is like, you know, um, the great writer Tolstoy, he says that, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he says that at, A-A-T, at, is transferring feeling from one hat to another. Mm. And what it does is it helps to remove the sense of separation between the one who creates the at and the one who perceives it or receives it. Mm. And I think when you're on the screen, it's why I can't take my eyes off of you is because it's not like, I mean, legit, I'm not just, I am not a kiss ass. Ask anybody who knows me. If I didn't feel it, I wouldn't say it, but I can't take my eyes off you because I feel like there is no separation between you. It is so accessible and it's so real. And again, it's because it's so present. So I want to talk about how you go from this guy who was this like, uh, acting, and then you have some sort of awareness of like, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. And you dive into, cause I, I was being a secret squirrel. So I went onto your website and I downloaded the, uh, the four steps to staying present, not just staying present, but becoming fucking creatively invincible, which who doesn't want that? Right? Anybody, right. entrepreneur, yeah. speaker, writer, actor, yeah. Who doesn't want to be fucking creatively invincible? Yeah. So can we just kind of talk? I know what the four steps are because I listened to the audio and did the okay. thing. Can we talk about the process a little bit that you came up with, the committed impulse and how you're changing people's lives with this thing? And especially, I think, people, to my point, who maybe being embodied or being in their bodies didn't feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I think you're helping people even with that. Even if you never want to act, I think your process is helpful. Yeah. Um, well, should we talk about the four access points? We can talk about, look at, let's be spontaneous. Whatever bubbles up, you go for it. You can, you can dance, you can <laughs> do whatever. Um, well, um, where to start? But... Well, let's talk about the four access points yeah. um, because um, when these four access points, and they're all na very natural and simple, um, but when they are um, being used, it 100% it pulls you into the moment. And by that, I mean... You know, um, I guess Deepak Chopra says we have like 64,000 thoughts a day and 98% of them we had yesterday. And so, and most of the time when people are listening to their thoughts, it's pretty abusive. Yeah, no, most of them are not kind. Yeah, most of them are like some form of I suck. Not and worthy, so, not lovable, all of it. All of it. And so, um, you know, when I was starting out i was just so in my head and you know i tried all kinds of different things and then started to discover that in the moments of where i was spontaneous where i was free to to create um that i wasn't listening to my mind and i had tried to improve my thoughts but that was that was kind of still operating within the same mechanism. And so that didn't, that didn't work. And so what I started to see and experiment with and myself and then, you know, experimenting with other people was that by connecting to what's actually in front of us, like profoundly connecting to it, um, you know, and, and by that, you know, like actually seeing in terms of color, shape, texture, lightness, darkness, like to actually see what's there because typically we, we go like, oh, computer, wall, window, you know, 
um, you know, chair, as opposed to actually seeing like, what is that? What is the shape of that? What is that there? And that's one way to pull out of listening to this. And it's basically we want to shift what we listen to as opposed to try to improve thoughts. So by sh connecting to this, connecting to the nuance of information in the body. I mean, you're a yoga teacher. I started doing yoga when I was six and it's been like an ongoing journey of just there's so much information in here that we disregard and by maintaining a connection to this and what's out here and breathing it's it shifts us into like a it opens the creative channel yeah and i believe yeah I, yeah i believe we are conduits that we are vessels we are for the for whatever you call it the divine or inspiration or the muse or um present like there's a thousand words for it yeah but i think what you're talking about you know i always say to my clients um the assignment is alignment and i think that's like kind of what's happening in this moment is like you're bringing yourself right into this dynamic moment where now anything becomes possible i think yeah that way. yeah and then the other, the other piece of it is, you know, in, in my classes, you know, we do this and I've been teaching on Zoom, um, you know, <laughs> COVID, which has been actually kind of amazing. But anytime anybody, you know, will be engaged with what's in front of you and then like you, then there's a moment where you don't even know you've left and you're kind of listening to the, some chatter. And then, then there's a moment where you realize, oh my God, I've just missed what's happened in front of me. And when that occurs in my class, like everybody says, I'm back. Okay. Okay. So people are constantly training themselves to stay, to, to come back. Can because just, Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I get so excited, just, go ahead. If there's a part of our brain that wants to keep us in the past and the future. Like if that's where, that part of our brain feels secure. We time travel. Yeah, we time travel. And so it's just, it's really retraining the nervous system that you can be fully here and not get killed. Like that's basically the, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's ancestral, you know, it's like somewhere in our lineage you know, like maybe someone was in a cave and they were like, and they didn't, they saw somebody just walk out and get, you know, eaten, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, okay, I'm going to stay inside and, and, and like keep an yeah. eye out. And, and, and that person survived, you know, and so then, but, you know, it's so in, then. It, it's in, it's in the brain. Yeah, but it's no longer serves us. Yes. It's, you know, and it certainly doesn't <laughs> serve us if we want to create. Uh, you know, Andre Debus um, always says to me, you know, well, he doesn't just, he said it to me many times, but he says one of the, um, one of the fastest ways to kind of kill creativity or the, the, the greatest enemy to creativity is self-consciousness. And like this thing of like being like, you know, so um, drawn in and aware and, you know, here's what's, so here's what's funny about I'm back. And so I know, I know my clients and listeners are probably cracking up laughing because totally unbeknownst to me until I just went and like got the four steps and did the whole thing. So I'm a long time Course in Miracles student. Mm -hmm. You know, Marion Williamson is like, you know, my, my spiritual mom. And so um one of the things that we say in Course in Miracles is we take detours into fear. Oh, you've taken a detour into fear. Mm. So whenever I notice that I've left my right mind and I've taken a detour into fear, what I've been saying for like years and years and years is, and I'm back. And because as you notice, I'm a very, like when I'm excited, like I get very excited. So when I story tell sometimes, I always say like, I have a long leash. Like, I'm gonna go out here, I'm always gonna come back, but sometimes I'll go off on a riff and then I go, and I'm back. Right. So imagine my delight. Wow. When I see that it's like, it is literally one of you, and I'm not taking credit for it, I'm just doing simpatico, like going like, dude, like I love that you do that because it is so helpful yeah. to recognize that you can choose to come back, or at least when you recognize you've left, you yep. can come back. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's powerful. Yeah. And the more that you, in the beginning, 
of, you know, practicing that, like, typically it's almost like shocking, you know, <laughs> how often it's like, and, but the more that you practice it, like the amounts of time that you're connected to your breath and your body, your immediate environment and whatever you're engaged in, you know, increases. And then when you do check out, it becomes quite startling. Noticeable. Yes. I, I think it's beautiful. And you know, the four steps are like so embodied. So we have like that, that piece of like taking your immediate environment, because here's what I know what happens when people get anxious or scared, or they're about to go on stage, or they're about to do a one-to-one -one call or make an offer, you know, as an entrepreneur, like do as whatever the thing is, you know, your heart starts going, the, the way that the body reacts for me, it's like, I'm going to have to go to the bathroom. Like that's how my body just wants to dump everything. Right. Um, you know, I know Jake Gyllenhaal says like, same thing. He has to run to the bathroom. I know famous people who like puke before they like do things. So the body starts having all these experiences and it's almost just like you're so in, but I mean, in and up in your head that you almost can't see what's in front of you. So when, I think, right, I, mean, I can only speak from my own experience. It's almost just like, what? Like, like time and space. And so when you're helping people to get anchored in their immediate environment, I just think it's very, that anchoring and grounding moment, I think is really powerful. And it's like, it's so- And, like, and if, if I can just add one thing, that, um, it's not, uh, from what I teach, it's never about trying to get rid of anxiety or fear or any of those sensations. It's But if you actually experience what you call anxiety, like the most common when I ask people, well, what do you actually feel? And they go, I just feel anxiety. It's like, no, but what do you actually feel? Right. And it's often just like a vibratory thing. And I was like, well, like, is it that bad? Like, if you don't call it anxiety, it's just like a, an energetic charge. And just to connect to it, as soon as you try to disconnect from something that's happening, you're going to end up in your head. Mm -hmm. If you try to get rid of, because a lot of people, when they say, I, I feel anxiety, it's really that they're, they had a, a momentary um, physical sensation that they didn't like, or they have an association is bad. And so they try to disconnect with it and then they're spinning in their head. And so the other, what the opportunity is, is to fully connect to the charge that's there because it's all good. If we can get that, there's nothing. Get rid of the labels. Yeah, get rid of the labels and get, it's like we don't know what we're going to feel. And so better to increase your tolerance for it as opposed to, coming up with tricks to try to feel less, which will disconnect you from your audience and put you in your head. Well, I think that's what makes your process different than most of the, uh, get rid of your fear of public speaking, get yeah. rid of your anxiety, because they're, they're, you can't dominate the feeling. You can't, you well, can you try. Can suppress yourself. No, right, you can try to suppress it, like, but that's what I'm saying, like, but you can't, what you're talking about, again, I think is, transmuting it. It's like allowing it. It's almost like I think of your work. I hope you take this as a compliment, but I, I think of your work like being, it's like a playground. Mm -hmm. It's like, can we just play yeah. and be spontaneous and have the awareness of like, oh, I'm anxious or I'm, I, I'm feeling this thing that feels like, and it's the same thing like when in spiritual mentoring, like people will say, oh, I'm this, or I feel this, or I think this. And it's that peeling back of the onion, right? Like, well, why? But what is that? What, what are you really upset about? In fact, I just did a whole podcast episode called It's Not About the Pasta. Because like people get pissed and they think they're arguing about this thing in couples. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. It's not even about that. It's right. like this. And we, we, we it, to be able to be present to whatever is coming up is a very powerful thing. And I love that you say, well, let's not like demonize it or make it bad. Can we, can we be with it and see what happens next in a way?
Am mm-hmm. I am I saying that like does that feel? Yeah, I mean it's it's just the practice of increasing your tolerance for you, oh, as well. opposed, to, you know, or or you know for oneself, because we vibrate. You know, we're atoms. Like that's you know that's what my yeah. dad. You know, as a little kid, he's. I said like, what do you do? Like, and he said. You know, do you see your knee? I was like, yes. He said, you see this table? I was like, yes. He said, the smallest part of your knee and the smallest part of that table are the same thing, and it's atoms. And then when I started auditioning, like out of, you know, early on, I was had so much energy, and I was trying to relax because that's what I was taught in school. Like, an actor has to be relaxed all the time. and. <laughs> You know, and I was, and then I would get, maybe get myself relaxed, but then I'd be so in my head, and then everything shifted once I just connected. Like emotions are energetic patterns. Yes, they're not good. They're not bad. And you know, if you can think of that energetic pattern as the creative impulse, as as like that's what you have to create. Okay, with, that's powerful. So you know, yeah. then then it's like then everything starts to open and okay like, wait john i'm gonna be yeah, I just say one, let me oh, say no, got, one, I got is that if you are feeling anxiety like the notion is that and you had to say publicly speak the notion is i've got to get rid of that because they will think mm, i'm not professional they will think uh blah blah whatever it may be but the truth is if you connect to it fully, like connect to the anxiety and like, yeah, I'm fucking anxious. What's <laughs> up? I'm, you know, then it's like, th- then you immediately connect the audience to you. But if you try to alter you, what's going on with you, you disconnect the audience. You're being honest. Yeah. But the reason why I, wa- I was being rude and wanted to interrupt you is because Not you said rude. something so profound, which was- oh! Dude, I'm not okay. messing around here. Listen is, listen is, attune okay. your ears, attune your ears to what this Smarty Pants just said. He says, that thing that you're feeling is the creative impulse. Yeah. Like that is a fucking game changer. You yeah. better put that on a t-shirt. Committed impulse, yeah. But that that thing that is arising in you, so... It's like, again, every time you're talking, it's like ping, ping, ping. All these things are like lighting up. And, and the first time I ever went to Kripalu, I'm not going to go into the long story, but I showed up for my yoga teacher training like 20 years ago and had to like live there for a month. And I'm like this kid, this potty mouth kid from Boston, like rolling with my, with my friggin' like really bag up the stairs. And the first poster I see is a, is a picture of Swami Kripalu and the word Kripalu means compassion. And the quote is, yoga is tolerating the consequences of being yourself. And I'm thinking here as you're talking, it's just like, right, because what yoga does is it creates a greater capacity, right, to be with yourself. And Swami Kripalu says, like, the highest form of spiritual practice there is, is self-observation without judgment. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's kind of what you're talking about in a way. Yeah. But I want people like, look at, I don't know if I have any actors in, in, in my audience, but I think like, and I'm sure I know that I, I know that I definitely have a few, but I'm just thinking anybody who is listening to this, who creates in any way, this is like invaluable stuff. The yeah. four steps take in your immediate environment. And you guys, you can download this. You can go to his website and, and you can download, like you can get this four steps. Wait, you got, you talk. Go ahead. I just want to say just about that. We, we made a link, which is like committed impulse.com slash, and then Karen Kenny. (gasps) Yeah. We made that for you. I fucking love having my own link, dude. If you put that in, you'll get, you know, you'll get the, um, the four access points. It's about like 20 minutes. It's great. It is great. I listen. Well, it's 28 minutes. Listen to it. It's fantastic. I didn't mean to, cor- I didn't mean to correct you. I'm just saying no, no. Uh, it's good stuff. So the take in your immediate environment, I don't even want to tell them, you know what? Fuck that. You got to go get it. I'm not even going to tell you what they are, but I'm going to tell you that it's really powerful. And if you're in 
the holistic world at all. If you are a yoga teacher, if you're um, a dance therapist, a music person, a creative of any kind, and if you're an entrepreneur, you're a creative um, on some level, you got to be. Um, then it's going to be so incredibly helpful. And it reminds me too of like, in Kripalu Yoga, we have a process called Burfwa. <laughs> Burfwa, B-R-F-W-A. And it, it's breathe, feel, watch. No, yeah, breathe, feel, no, breathe, relax, feel, watch, allow. And as a kid, like as I was a kid, yeah, I was like 20 something when I, when I went to Kripalu. But as a person who didn't know how to be embodied, like learning how to like stay in the room was a skill set that like changed my life. Mm. And I think the thing is, is that when you're present, you become a much better listener. Yeah. Even with, let's talk about this, Josh, which we haven't talked about yet. Okay. Your process, I think it helps people in their marriages and in their relationships. Yeah. You would not fight me on that, would you? No. I mean, a lot of, you know, you know, I, I put it under, you know, after training, but it's, you know, there's always, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's always at least 25% non-actors that take, um, you know, the classes that I teach and it, it helps people in their life immensely. And, you know, and for me, you know, I think being an actor you know, part of the job is to, is to be able to, you know, live with all of this stuff because as an actor, like this is the instrument, this is the tool, but that's really true for all of us too, you know, for it's, it's, and the more, more you can land in your body, the more you can hear other people and the more you can increase your tolerance for you, the more you can withstand like listening to other people. And if that creates a charge, you can hang out with it without being like, you know. Fucking out of here. Fucking out of here. <laughs> Fuck Don't like you. you. Don't like you. Yeah. Fuck and you. Don't like, like you. Damn. But it's so true. It, cr it creates a larger capacity to hold space. And all, I mean, if you're a coach or a mentor of any kind, you had better learn how to hold space. And as a gateless writing teacher, like, you know, I always say to people, you know, we can create a safe container for the writer, but I can't guarantee that something that they read won't trigger you or won't bring something up. And if you have no skills, if you have no spiritual tools in your spiritual toolkit that allow you to have a greater capacity for your brothers and sisters, you are going to suffer. Yeah, and I don't even see it. I mean, it, it certainly falls under spiritual, but it's really all this stuff is just practical. And it's just oh, wicked utilize, practical, you know, but utilizing the human uh, beings, you know, so to speak, using what's, you know, the, the natural tools that we have that, you know, there's very little in our society that encourages us to, you know, to do this. And I think a lot of it is that you know, we're so from very from birth, we're so conditioned to believe that there's good things to feel and bad things to feel. Mm -hmm. And if you feel the bad things, you got to fix them. But that's what screws everybody <laughs> up. Because it's all natural to us, all, this whole range, it's all natural. Yeah. Well, and just to be fair, like I, I want you to hear, like, I, I mean, I just come at it. I come at everything from that spiritual point of view, because I do think we're spiritual beings having a human experience. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying necessarily that you view your work that way. I'm just saying the way that I relate it to like all the, the multiplicity, all the multiple ways that it expresses I just think it is an incredibly spiritual practice, whether or not people think that, feel that, whatever. I, I just did a I just did a podcast episode called "Stop Apologizing for the Woo." I think that this process is. I have to listen to that. It's incredibly intuitive, Josh. What you're doing, and I think intuitiveness is listening to call it the inner teacher, the divine, the creative impulse. To me, it's all the same thing. Yeah. And I just love that you're giving people, like I know I, I just saw a um, testimonial from one of the guys who took your workshop and he was a therapist. 
And mm-hmm. he was saying, I'm not going to be an actor, but these, these, this workshop, and I know my friend, our mutual friend, Kate Northrup, like years ago, like did a little thing with you. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I just know that like it can, it can be used in, I'm giving you a little plug here, Josh. It can be used ah. in a, a bunch of different ways. And I think ah. the most important thing I would just say to people is to just show up in curiosity. Because I think that's what's happening when we do good, bad. It's all that judgment. Yeah. But if we could just stay in curiosity, then that's when it like, it becomes fun. Yeah. Yeah. Fun is key. It's got to be fun. I don't do it. At 52, John, I'm like, look, I don't, I think you're a little older than me, but I'm like, look, if it's not fun, I don't want to do it. And I don't mean like, I mean, you go to funerals, you do the right thing, you do what you got to do. But in my work, if it doesn't light me up, I'm not interested. Yeah. No, thank you. All right, I have one more question for you. And then I want you to share anything that you, you want to share. Yeah. So um, my beautiful friend, again, Andre Debuse III, he wrote an incredible memoir called Townie. I highly recommend reading it. It's incredible. It's so physical too, because it's all about how he became a writer. Like his dad is the famous short story writer, Andre the Buse. But it's all about like, you know, he grew up like I did. He's a Merrimack Valley kid, Massachusetts, hardcore. And he grew up in a very violent childhood. And so he was like fighting, like to the point of like incredibly violent. So he was bullied as a kid, but then he became um like a bully of bullies like he was looking for guys who were hurting women and hurting whatever to like fight and then he had this pivotal moment when he sat down to write and and when he was 21 and he never looked back and it changed him and he said he felt like his truest self when he was writing the reason why i'm asking this is just a curiosity question yeah talks about what it takes to be able to punch somebody in the face and i'm going to read you what he said he said um You have to move through two barriers to do something like that. One inside of you and then one around you as if everyone's body is surrounded by an invisible membrane that you have to puncture to get to them. Mm. And he talked about it as like the kinesphere and how each of us, and I think of the kinesphere as like, you know, the the space, when I extend my limbs, like this is my kinesphere, the space around me. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if somebody invades that space, to me, it's like a chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. Now, very briefly, I heard you kind of mention kinesphere Mm -hmm. on an episode or an interview. Can you just talk about that and how it plays into the work? Because I'm just wicked curious. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Well, I've created a set of tools called interatomics. And these tools encompass all of human behavior. And one of the tools has to do with kinesphere, which is um, the, I think your kinesphere, your kinesphere is bigger than this. Um, But some people have their kinesphere um, is uh, maybe just at, at their physical body level. And often those people like can have, they have like no sense of space. Like they can just walk up to you and they, they'll talk to you really close and they have no sense of space. And then some people have um, a, a large kinesphere where they are holding people back. Yes. It's like, I'm going to hold this space. It's big. And I'm going to hold people back. Um, don't come in. And, you know, it's like if you come in, it's like it's an issue and it's going to stir things up. And then another possibility is you can have a big kinesphere and I call it welcome to my living room. And it's like a big kinesphere and it's like, come on in. And there's also another side of the small kinesphere where it's like somebody that withdraws inside. So they're departing this, you know. And so these are actually things that can be, you know, that I teach people how to alter their kinesphere. And it, um, it's just an amazing tool for an actor because by simply altering your kinesphere, it's going to generate behavior that's spontaneous. Um, and, you know, and th- it's just one way to define a character. For 
public speakers, for you know other people, it's like if their kinesphere is very you know inward, or you know armor is like another tool you know that you can put up or take down with just learn you know learning how. It's like it can alter how somebody approaches the world, how they approach their day to day world. And so not only are these tools amazing, you know, they started out like, oh, these are what is the, what is behavior and like breaking that down almost scientifically and then teaching people how to alter it. And it's and it's an amazing tool for non actors as well as an amazing tool for actors. I 100% agree with you. And as a kid who wanted to be Dr. Doolittle when I was a little kid, that was my number one gig. Uh, <laughs> you were obsessed with like animal behavior and it kind of, right? Am I making that shit up? Like that's no, true, that's right? Great. Yeah. And so I think like this whole thing, like you, you in such a way as such a scientist, yeah, such a cre like it's it's fascinating actually. I think you're a really cool dude, man. Like I, I'm so, I'm so happy you came on the show and that you're sharing parts of yourself and, and your work. And, you know, this is the stuff like after you're gone, that is going to uh, reverberate and echo out and like remain and whether you call it legacy or whatever people call it. I just think it's like the thumbprint. It's like, it's the mock, it's the mock that you are leaving. And I think the reason why I wanted you to really come on the show is I, I know that this stuff is helpful. And I think it's a really you know, it's, it's in my zone of a, like, I'm not an actor, but um, it, it is very applicable, I think, to the people, to anybody. Like, I, I just think like this kind of thing is a powerful way to get to know yourself, to know how you act and react, to understand, like, even that, that thing of kinesphere. When I go on stage to speak, it's like, we swing open the doors. Like, it is just like, <laughs> and that just feels like magic. Uh -huh. That is just like, that's, and this is what I'm saying. Like, oh, I didn't know that that's like the living room in a way. Like, that's how I think of it now. That's how I'll think of it. Yeah. I'm inviting them into the living room. Right. And like, what a cool thing to just be able to go like, oh, that's kind of what's happening. So I just, I just love, dude, I just love what you're up to in the world. And I know that you have here, I knew I couldn't remember everything off the top of my head. And I want to make sure, I want to just say this, I want to say a couple of things. So you, it is described your committed impulse as a new revolutionary and fully comprehensive approach to acting that departs from traditional heady kind of base methodologies. Committed Impulse has launched countless careers and reignited the joy of acting for thousands of actors. However, it is also for speakers and writers and entrepreneurs and creators of all kinds. So you guys, if you're listening to this, go check it out. If you just Google Josh Pice and it's spelled P-A-I-S, you're gonna find a you're gonna find some pretty funny old videos too of like <laughs> talking about nin Ninja Mutant Turtles. But it's kind of like this thing. But you're gonna find all about uh, committed impulse and all of your contact stuff is gonna be in the show notes and stuff too. But um, I know that you just wrapped up the um, the spy movie that's gonna be coming out. But yeah. I know you also just shot a pilot for something uh, called. DMZ. It's on HBO Max. I know you can't tell us too much about it, but you give us a little, little, a little bite size. Sure. I mean, Ava DuVernay uh, directed it, and she's just a genius. Uh, <laughs> and it's um, it's set uh, eight years in the future. Um, the United States has gone into a civil war. Gone into you know, um, God forbid. <laughs> And, uh, and basically, you know, middle Mer America has cut off New York and New York has become like a wild zone, like on no rules, no. And it's like people, you know, create these colonies and gangs in this whole world uh, within uh, New York. And it's just, it's amazing. And it's a real like adventure and like uh, has like, you know, some political undertones, but it's just, it's just brilliant and it's such an adventure. And it's set, and it's so cool that it's, you know, typically things that are set in the future, it's like 25 years in the future or 100 yeah, years, but this like, is eight years. And that's so, I just find that so intriguing. I, I think it's intriguing too. And I think it's purposeful, obviously, and intentional. 
And I think it's already got me thinking. So that's like really cool. And you can't tell us anything about your character. Can you? Can you know? It's okay. Uh, I'm not going to twist your arm. Don't get yourself in trouble. Okay. I, I mean, know how the, I know how the people can say he, he, um, uh, maybe I, yeah. <laughs> he, he had a very menial job. I'll yeah. just say that. He had a very menial job before this happened. Yep. And now he's got a very powerful uh, job. In, oh, in he gave, he gave. You know, oh. very dark and it's funny and weird. And yeah, it's just great. It's, I already know if you're in it, I'm in. Like anything okay. you're in, I'm in. It's it's really good and and um, some of the one of the creators from um, Westworld um, yeah. created this and it's just it's so good so I, I have no I have no doubt uh, I'm already dying to see it when when do you know when roughly a release date is uh, no it'll probably a, a year something like that all right and then isn't there like a TV two against nature. With the uh, yeah, Two Against yeah. Nature is uh, a movie that was um, that w we still have to finish, and the Safdie brothers uh, are kind of co-directors on it, and those guys um, they they did uh, Uncut Gems mm -hmm. and, um, and Good Time. They're just brilliant guys, so fun, and so um, we still need to we've finished we've shot like most of the movie and kind of probably once covid settles down a bit um we're gonna finish um shooting that just i'm just so thrilled to work with those guys they're just so smart so creative um uh, kettle calling it takes one to know one as we said as kids takes one to know one because i just think like you've been working since 1990 there's a reason for that and i think you just get better and better Thank you. I think you just get better and better. And you're, like I said, it is a joy. Like, I mean, I'm I, obviously, I, like I worked at a movie theater, like with 18 screens, I was obsessed. Like I, I love movies because I love storytelling. Yeah. And New England kids, Boston kids, New York is too. We have a wicked low, like our bullshit meter, like alarm bells ring. If I see, like I can't watch bad acting. Like I get pissed. Like it infuriates me. I'm like, stop it. Like stop that. Like that aggravate. I'm like, don't do it. <laughs> and I understand everybody's growing and trying. I'm not trying to be mean. But like Andre told this story too. We just did an incredible memoir writing workshop, and he was talking about how when he lived in New York, he would like be so broke, but he would like scramble together some dollars to go see see a play. And he was talking about this play he saw one time with Ralph Macchio and De Niro. I think no, you've no. worked with De Niro, haven't you? I have, yeah. Yeah, and he's talking about- I saw that too, yeah, go ahead. And she's like, so Ralph comes out on the stage, he's a young kid at this point. He goes and he just kind of like, uh, like flounders around and like says his lines and like, and he's just like, uh, and, and, and so I'm gonna make a point in a minute, but he goes, and then De Niro walks out. He doesn't say a fucking word because he doesn't have to. And he like he describes and like how he just walks slowly over to, to the to the mirror and like he combs his hair or something, right? And then he like adjusts the picture of his of his wife. And then he walks over at the desk and he like picks up a pencil and and he's like, and you can't take your eyes off him. And he goes, and what you realize, like, and then like Machio comes back out, like, ah, right. And he goes, and you could sense in a way that Ralph just kind of felt like. He didn't embody it. He didn't take up the real estate. Like he was just like, it's De Niro. I don't deserve to be here. Let mm -hmm. me just like uh, say my stuff and get out of here. And I thought it was so powerful. And now it just came up into my, blah, 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 when I was talking to you, cause I'm thinking like, like that's, that's one of those things. Like if he, he couldn't like, he couldn't think about what, how different that would have been if he had committed impulse. Yeah. So it's one of those things, but is there anything else that you want to say? Anything maybe I haven't covered or just- I think, I, I don't know what, I think you've covered everything. Well, uh, I, I am just, again, thank you so much for taking the time to be thank here. You. Thank you. Good, good chatting and- Yeah, it's fantastic. And yeah. so you guys, like I said, um, I will put all the links and the thing, will you just repeat that link that you guys yeah, made again? Uh, committed Impulse, C-O-M-M-I-T-T-E-D, 
impulse, I-M-P-U-L-S-E, slash. Dot com slash. Uh, dot com slash Karen. Karen Kenny. Yeah. And, and you guys, you can find, you can find Josh on Instagram, you know, um, uh, with again, slash committed impulse. Just go and check him out. Check the brother out. He's doing amazing stuff in the world. I'm so happy that you're brother out. Come on. What? I'm be it's true. Yeah. 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 I'm agreeing. Yeah. Like I don't like, yeah, it's like, go check it out. Like do it, do yourself a favor and check it out because it's a totally different approach than anything else I've seen. And I'm just, I'm so excited. I'm excited that your work is getting out in the world. And I just do, I think it's just gonna keep growing and growing and growing. Oh, but please tell people how they can work with you right now. You're doing online Zoom thingies, right? Yeah, I mean, there's always classes uh, on the website, you know, committedimpulse.com. Um, I do, um, I'll do like, I, I only just because of my schedule, like I'll coach six people at a time over a three month period, but not more than that. But you know, the coaching is awesome. And then just look at, and then there's an online program, which encompasses how to do this work if you just want to do it on your own. And then, uh, and then several times a year, I'll, I teach um, either in person or zoom. And that's just you know the, those suckers the, sell out fast though i think don't they yeah they said i don't let them be too big um just because i love to you know work with each person um but yeah just look on the website there's always new stuff um always popping a blog out every now and then and uh i pop a blog out yeah i like that i, like that. Right? I don't know but <laughs> Well, anyway, I, yeah, dude, I, I look just, forward to working with, you know, anybody that's interested in exploring this work and, you know, it's a, it's a passion of mine. Oh, uh, clearly, clearly. Yeah. I think, I think it's your divine assignment, man. I just really do. I think, and here's what's beautiful about it. It's the last thing I'm going to say, cause I could talk to you all day. I think that the vehicle that you've created is, um, it's helping like it, how do I say it? it? It is like exponentially effective, right? Because you help a coach or an entrepreneur or whatever, and it touched the lives. Like Tolstoy says, like you are transferring feeling from your heart to so many other hearts. And then each person who receives it then gets to go out and it just keeps going out and out and out. And it's just, man, no, that's, I love it. You spent, your, you spent your time here well, brother. And so <laughs> thank you so much again. And you guys go check out my friend, Josh, not to be like an assumer friend, you know what I mean? Go check out my friend, Josh. His work is amazing. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate you guys. And remember, wherever you go, leave the people, the place, the animals, the environment better than how you found it. Wherever you go, may you be a blessing. Bye. Hey, you guys, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Karen Kenny Show. <laughs> I super duper appreciate your time, friendship, and support. And look, if something that I shared from my heart today somehow landed in yours, I'd love to hear about it. So please tag me on Facebook or Instagram or IG stories or wherever the cool kids are hanging out these days and let me know what your favorite pot was or what you found most helpful. You can find me over at Karen Kenny Live. That's Karen, K-E-N-N-E-Y-L-I-V-E. -E. And if you're digging what I'm saying and you want to hear more, I'd be wicked grateful if you could go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review because you guys, that's how you'll help me to keep spreading the love. And if you can think of someone that could benefit from hearing this episode, please share it with them. I'd also love to stay connected with you. So if the feeling is mutual, please go to karenkenny.com backslash freebie and download my free guide to building your spiritual team. Until next time, my brothers and sisters, keep living in the fearless flow. Know that I see you, I appreciate you, and I love you. And wherever you go, may you be a blessing. <laughs>